Well, good afternoon and welcome. And I, I uh, want to thank each of our panelists and each of our participants for joining us this afternoon. And on behalf of the, the Canadian American uh, Business Council and its Entrepreneur Circle, and my co-host Lena Trudeau joins me here, uh, we're just very excited about presenting a commercial a program on the commercial opportunities in space. Uh, North America uh, has led and leads, continues to lead the world in bringing the entrepreneurial spirit to space. Uh, our North American entrepreneurs and business executives uh, are at the very forefront of the space industry. And our panelists today are uh, among those uh, movers and shakers of the space industry. Some of the sectors that we may uh, touch on today include uh, launch, satellite, satellite repair and debris removal, space manufacturing, space tourism, space stations and space colonization, and mining across the solar system. Uh, so as you can see, it is truly a, a brave new world and to uh, educate us and to inform us. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, today uh, uh, it's, as you can see, a wonderful panel assembled. Uh, I will just introduce them very, very briefly and ask them following that to make some opening remarks. Uh, Holly Johnson is the Vice President of Robotics and Space Operations of MDA Space. And MDA Space is Canada's leading satellite systems, geo-intelligence and robotics, space robotics company. Uh, Sasha Jacob is the Chairman and Founder Founder of Jacob Capital Management and the chairman and founder of Maritime Launch, Canada's first spaceport. And Stephen Matye is the co-founder, CEO, and driving force behind Maritime Launch. And he brings incredible talent and experience to the business of spaceports and launch vehicles. David Anderman uh, is the operating partner of Stellar Ventures. Uh, providing important capital needs uh, for the uh, newest ventures in space. But he has an incredible resume. Uh, and some of those experiences include uh, being the GC of uh, the General Council of SpaceX and Lucasfilm. So uh, again, uh, our panelists are people of immense uh, talent and range of experience. I, I will report, uh, sadly, that uh, our our uh, panelist, Alex Fielding, uh, is unable to join due to illness, um, but I do, do want to mention that Alex is the CEO of Privateer. He's a serial entrepreneur and space pioneer. Um, he uh, has been backed by and is backed by Steve Wozniak, Lux, Kleiner Perkins, and a lot of uh, Silicon Valley's uh, most recognized names. Um, and I came all the way over to Maui to see him, and he, I'm not going to be able to see him. <laughs> and he said, "Aloha, I've got COVID." But anyway, that's uh, he's he. I, I knowing Alex, he'll be he'll make a, a record recovery, uh, record time recovery. Uh, so uh, you know, we have uh, attendees from all across North America. We have panelists from all across North America, and all tackling the opportunities and driving the opportunities uh, in space in, in new and exciting ways. Holly, let me uh, turn it over to you to open up and uh, share a few uh, remarks with uh, our attendees today. For sure. Uh, thank you, Jay. And um, thank you to the Canadian American uh, Business Council. It's uh, it's pretty exciting uh, when you've worked in space for a few years and um, you get you have the the invitation to participate in such a such an impressive uh, panel with a, a, a impressive suite of uh, of speakers here um, to speak about space, which is something that I think up until a few years ago um, was something that uh, you only touched upon in uh, in uh, the science uh, section of the of the newspaper. But it's it's mainstream now, and, and I'm very happy to be able to um, bring my experience to um, to the panel in a in a very humbling way uh, against a, a cast of very impressive characters. So. Um, thank you for having us. Um, 
As Jay mentioned, my name is uh, Holly Johnson. I'm currently the, the Vice President of the Robotics and Space Operations Group at MBA. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of MBA, uh, yeah, you're not in the, uh, the minority. Uh, we're working to change that. Um, but you may have heard of something called the Canada Arm. Um, MDA was the designer and uh, builder, and we, we still do uh, support engineering um, operations for uh, Canada Arm missions on the International Space Station. So the first Canada Arm flew uh, more than 90 space shuttle missions um, uh, on an iconic uh, space shuttle program. Uh, Canada Arm 2 has been in, uh, in orbit, operational for more than 20 years now. Um, and just recently announced, uh, we are uh, uh, taking on the design phase, the, the phase B st stage of Canadarm3, um, which is the new uh, artificial intelligence-based robotic system that will is the Canadian contribution to the NASA-led mission that will orbit the moon. Um, and so as we'll, uh, we'll talk about today, I'm sure across the panelists, there's a renewed interest in going to the moon. Um, there's a renewed interest in uh, establishing a position uh, out uh, in cislunar space and uh, on the surface of the moon, as well as around the moon. Um, with aspirations to eventually take that on to Mars. And so um, it's uh, really exciting to contribute uh, Canada Arm 3 to that, and uh, it's keeping us very busy. Um, I, I do represent the Robotics and Space Operations Group here at MDA, but um, I have peers that uh, touch on or uh, lead the other two sections that Jay talked about um, uh, in his intro. Uh, so MDA also provides um, uh, satellite communications expertise out of our Montreal office. So building satellite uh, uh, communication subsystems and full satellites that uh, provide in-space communications that connect the world. And then our, our division on the West Coast of Canada is a geointelligence. So Earth observation missions, um, designing and operating um, uh, satellite missions that take uh, radar based predominantly images of the Earth. Um, and uh, provide data and uh, imagery to uh, customers all around the world uh, for um, their missions. And so very happy to be uh, here today and uh, thank you for the, the introduction, Jay. But Holly, what we really wanna know is can you control the Canada arm from right behind you right now? <laughs> Those are the secret buttons, exactly. Yeah, I just turn around. <laughs> Good Have question. <laughs> uh, Sasha, maybe uh, we'll tee you up next. Great, thanks, Jay. Thanks uh, for putting together this, uh, this great event. Um, just uh, some further background uh, on myself. I like to uh, refer to myself as a reformed investment banker. Uh, spent a long career as an investment banker, um, originally as Canada's first investment banker in renewables and clean tech, uh, where I managed about $10 billion of equity uh, transactions in that sector. Um, ran a full service investment dealer in that area. And what we really specialized in was highly regulated industries uh, that were going through transformational changes, in particular, often deregulation, um, and like to be early in sectors uh, before the bigger banks came in. The same holds true now as, as principal investors. We're purely uh, principal investors in, um, in renewables and, uh, and now space. So uh, I think space has a, a lot of the, the similarities that we saw um, in renewables early on, uh, and you know, very much venture capital driven now, but uh, transforming into a, a more conventional, hopefully, asset class uh, as the, the market uh, expands. Uh, with $14 billion in, in investment last year uh, and a projection to go up to $40 billion um, in over the next decade uh, per year, it's a, a tremendously exciting uh, sector. Um, as Jay mentioned, I'm chair of Maritime Launch. Um, had the good fortune of meeting uh, Steve uh, a few years after he had founded uh, Maritime Launch. Um, and um, was uh, immediately attracted to, to uh, the, the, the proposition of what Maritime Launch was, was going to do for the space sector and for Canada within the, uh, the space industry. Stephen, I think that's a perfect uh, pre-introduction for your opening remarks. Sounds, sounds like a segue to me, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. My name is, is Steve Matier, and I am the Chief Executive Officer and President for Maritime Launch Services. Uh, we are building Spaceport Nova Scotia uh, in a little place at the end of the road uh, near Cancel Nova Scotia is the perfect place for uh, putting satellites uh, that uh, this team is experienced at building into space and where the, where the market really wants, wants to put them. I've got a 30 plus year career in the industry, began working in the space shuttle program, uh, working on engine testing at the NASA White Sands Test Facility and supporting a number of rocket launches, uh, space shuttle launches uh, over, over 16 years. 
and then started working in the spaceport development aspects after that, uh, starting with Spaceport America and moving forward in a number of directions uh, with, with locations internationally and nationally. I started a, an exercise back in 2015, actually, to begin looking at a location in North America for a launch site that would serve just where this market is going, the low Earth orbit, uh, constellation market that uh, requires hundreds if not thousands of satellites into orbit is looking for the right place and the idea is that um, all these federal ranges are pretty well booked up and, and having a commercial offering in industry is really the, the way to go. So that's what we're doing. We're working to bring Spaceport Nova Scotia to a reality uh, in Nova Scotia and I'm just uh, thrilled to be a part of it. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, well, I'm going to use a, a North American baseball analogy, David, uh, you know, whether you root for the Blue Jays or across to the San Francisco Giants, hopefully I'm connected out to the Bay Area. I know you're in Hawaii right now, but uh, are down in L.A. with the Dodgers. Uh, but uh, David, would you mind banning cleanup here and delivering your opening remarks? Sure, sure. Thank you so much for Jay for having us here. And for the Canadian American Business Council for hosting us. It, you know, it really is, as Sasha said, a super exciting time in, in the space industry. So, um, you know, time for investment in, in companies. It's, it's, you know, he likened it to, to investing in, uh, you know, renewables and in, uh, um, but it's also, I mean, I, I liken it sometimes to investing in, in 1994 in the internet business, but probably even more apt analogy is investing in, in, uh, in, uh, when, when the development of, uh, you know, genetic engineering really blossomed with the development of CRISPR, like eight, nine years ago, the genetics industry just took off and smart engineers who understand genetics and have brilliant ideas could suddenly had a free tool to be able to create, you know, unbelievable discoveries, right? Uh, very quickly uh, do genetic engineering in ways that were never possible before based on, you know, de decades of uh, investment by government and private industry in, in genetic uh, analyzing the human genome and then creating CRISPR. And the space industry is very much like that right now. You know, you have suddenly, literally in the last few years, uh, in large part because of companies like SpaceX, but also what Maritime Launch is planning to do as well, uh, you know, rockets that can launch much more cheaply to space. The cost, the cost of access to space has gone down multiple uh, you know, uh, orders of magnitude and it's, it's uh, and it's going down even further. So, um, it looks like it's leaving in two places. Got someone, someone's back. So as uh, Jay mentioned, I was most recently the general counsel of, of SpaceX, where I learned a lot about this area of business and, and the, the lowering costs of both launch as well as of, of creating these huge constellations uh, I was very heavily involved in the rollout of the Starlink low Earth orbit broadband internet system. Uh, and also learned a lot about launch and what the future of launch is going to be and what, what humans, you know, future in space and colonizing Mars is going to look like. And uh, my science fiction re reality followed a, a, a stint in science fiction <laughs> fiction. Uh, I was the COO and general counsel of Lucasfilm, which is George Lucas's uh, entertainment company, uh, ran the business and the technology. I was there for 16 years and sold the company to Disney. And then since then, I've been advising startups. And after I left SpaceX about a little over a year ago, I created a venture fund with two partners. Uh, we have just recently closed around, raised our first fund for $25 million to invest in seed and early stage space companies. And we're seeing every day, literally multiple new space startups that are taking advantage of this incredible opportunity to access space and launch new businesses that no one's ever thought of before. Uh, David, that uh, really sort of tees up a, a question because I, I think many of our participants today and the public generally, you know, their association with space would be in, in, the, in North America focused. Uh, would be NASA. Mm -hmm. And then they might say, oh, well, yeah, that a few billionaires like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and uh, Richard Branson launched themselves. And well, 
Elon hasn't gone yet. He sent a Tesla up there. But I mean, you know, launch themselves into space and maybe they send, uh, you know, William Shatner along too. But, you know, what that is obviously just the tip of the iceberg. And even what, you know, when you throw in what Boeing and Lockheed and some of our wonderful large North American based, uh, you know, uh, companies might be engaged in the when you when you uh, I think what might shock people, but I'm asking the panelists to respond, you know, is how deep and broad the industry is and how many wonderful companies uh, and, and how many great entrepreneurial opportunities there are. So maybe the venture capitalists want to speak to this uh, that we've got here, David and, and Sasha, but, uh, you know, the people putting money in earlier stage companies, but people leading companies like Holly and Stephen might also speak to that as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive change in the industry, right? I mean, and, and SpaceX is, is somewhat emblematic of it, but, you know, for a long time, as you said, you know, everyone considered governments to be the sponsors of, of, of space programs. And even though maybe they were working through big prime contractors like the Lockheeds and Northrop Grumman's of the world, um, you know, ULA, other companies, massive you know, conglomerates that have grown over many decades, in reality, it, it shifted quite a bit. And you went from these cost plus contracts where the government was really designing and owning the equipment and, and, and doing the launch operations in conjunction with these large primes. And now, you know, uh, the SpaceX contracts with NASA really, uh, and then ultimately also, you know, um, Lockheed also doing its own uh, agreements with NASA to do commercial space where the risk and the opportunity was really shifted to private companies. And uh, that is the future, right? I don't think you're ever going to see huge programs be launched by, you know, government space agencies very much more. I mean, I think all the money that you're going to see that the governments would otherwise spend is going to be spent with private companies. So that is a huge source between NASA and, of course, we didn't even mention the Department of Defense, which spends even more, right? The Department of Defense spends an incredible amount of money on space. Uh, and the militaries around the world spend a lot of money on space. Um, the opportunities for private companies to grow and thrive, starting off with government money and then ultimately taking advantage of commercial opportunities is just massive. Um, and it's not just government customers, right? These constellations are designed, in the case of Starlink, is designed direct to consumer, right? It's a direct to consumer global communications play, which has never been done before. There's no global communications company anywhere. And so these opportunities are not just you know, interesting and out there, but they're massive. And the markets that they're tapping into and the markets that they will disrupt are massive. So I think the opportunities are just endless. Like, that's why we keep talking about examples like the internet or CRISPR or, you know, um, renewables, uh, the clean, clean energy. You know, these are ground, ground changing, you know, change the entire dynamics of what happens. And it's going to change the nature of the human race. I mean, that's what's amazing. Jay, I think you're on mute still. Along with uh, a sector like, uh, you know, biotechnology, it's hard to imagine anything that uh, is going to, uh, you know, a more dynamic uh, industry or one that's going to have more profound uh, impact, uh, uh, you know, in the years to come. I, I see a question from one of our attendees, uh, and because I would just go on in a whole series following that, but let, let's Let's uh, direct to our Canadian participants. Why is the Canadian Space Agency and why are the likes of great companies like NBA keeping such a low profile? Uh, that's a great question. And I think uh, I think that's feedback enough. And I actually started my uh, my intro saying that for those who haven't heard of us, um, uh, aside from jokes that it's a, it's more of a Canadian thing to kind of fly under the radar. Um, I, I don't think I, I don't think that's intentional. And uh, um, I think a lot of uh, uh, people in Canada and, and leaders uh, such as Steve that run uh, companies in Can space tech companies in Canada, um, uh, it's not for lack of uh, punching above our weight. I, I think Canada has a phenomenal um, uh, industrial base of a space technology uh, offering um, that just sometimes just goes unheard of. Um, I was reading a, um, 
a research paper the other day that says can that said Canada was the third among nations in the independent uh, space tech companies. There was a uh, the number was just wow. phenomenal. And uh, um, uh, we often hear that Canada does punch above its weight. Uh, we were the third uh, country into space uh, behind uh, USSR and then uh, obviously the United States at the time. Um, and, and we have prominent uh, uh, contributions such as uh, not only the Canada arm, but other um, uh, other technologies. Um, I think from a, so I can't speak for the, from the Canadian Space Agency standpoint, but from MDA standpoint, um, we really aim to be recognized as a, as a trusted mission partner. So for us, we have this 52, 53 year heritage that uh, those in the industry might know about us, um, but many outside don't know. Certainly the likes of uh, a SpaceX and, uh, and other companies like that have a, have a bigger brand name. Um, we uh, we aspire to be that that recognized mission partner that uh, really enables other missions. So um, oftentimes we aren't the mission prime. Oftentimes we are providing enabling technology, uh, advanced technology in robotics or satellites or, or Earth observation missions. Um, and, and our customers come to us and uh, they stick around. They tend to we work with them and they tend to stick around for the the follow on uh, generation of their mission. And so. Um, uh, we aren't very recognized. We're working on uh, on addressing that. But uh, I would say, from a from a Canadian's perspective, um, I grew up thinking I would have to uh, move south of the border and go to NASA uh, if I wanted to work in the space industry. And I was uh, phenomenally surprised to know that Canada has such a, a thriving and and high potential industry. Um, and it's up for us to live up to that. So uh, I take the feedback, and uh, we're working on it. I don't know. Someone just commented, "No need to tweet nonsense to do a good job." I don't know. I was going to suggest you just. Holly, you start start tweeting crazy stuff, and you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to follow up on that, I think part of that is also uh, the, the the critical mass of public companies. I mean, uh, you know, outlets like CNBC and Bloomberg tend to cover predominantly public companies, uh, tradable securities, maritime launch is really the, the third uh, Canadian public company after MDA and Telesat um, to to be in the sector. So I think that. But uh, that increased visibility will will probably start to, to change that quite a bit. The U.S. really has all of the the comps to, in in the sector um, right now from a North American standpoint, and has had major major corporations, large cap corporations that have been involved in the industry for for many many years. So I, I think that evolution is is also happening now from the uh, public public markets. Yeah, I wouldn't speak for the government, but I can speak uh, about my relationship with the government and their participation in the industry these days. Uh, and it is certainly ramped up significantly. I come from the United States, sort of opposite of Holly, and ended up in Canada with my, 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 my space career and have really seen a shift in the focus and energy associated with the government's embrace of what this commercial launch opportunity is, the commercial industry is itself. You know, heading towards a, a trillion dollars in the next 18 or so years and looking what big role that we can really play in that location, location, location bit, it really matters. When you have the foundational companies such as MDA, Telesat, and, and many, many others here, uh, in Canada, and then you now add a domestic launch capability to it, uh, we're going to do a lot more than punch above our weight at this point. We're really going to take it on. And I really have seen that in, in, that embrace from every government acronym there is, uh, CSA, DND, Transport Canada, NAV Canada, uh, ICED, and, and, and the like. There really are uh, in tune and on board with getting this, getting this industry really moving. To just uh, expand on that a little bit, uh, Stephen, you know, what do you see as the desire, you know, from a from the entrepreneur's perspective, from the business executive's perspective? Um, obviously, the private sector is rushing, you know, headlong into to seize these uh, initial commercial opportunities in space and one can only imagine you know over the years and decades where that how that's going to evolve but the role of government the role of the Canadian government the role of the U.S. government um, you know how do you see the what's the what's the way that government can support and yet also protect uh, you know with respect the the population with respect to you know the development of space well, things they protect significant. the public interest, but not impede the private interest. Well, industry really began to change significantly in 2011 with the last space shuttle landing. Um, that and miniaturization of everything that has that has changed the 
the idea of these satellites going from multi tons to 150 kilograms and, and it just has changed the whole way forward uh, for space exploration and government basically taking a backseat and stepping out of that industry. So they that help of the, of fostering what we're doing uh, and, and helping seed us with some of the contracts that they need to, the, the, the things that they need to put into space. You look at SpaceX as an example. I mean, they had the NASA COTS contract and Antares with a Northrop Grumman or Orbital ATK, whatever, going back when. Um, it's the same thing. There was some seeding because there was some need that government had that they're now investing in commercial to do. And I see that beginning to happen in Canada as well, where there is a real need for uh, these kinds of capabilities that they don't want to have to do, but they can purchase seats. Uh, you know, purchase satellites and, and, and foster their needs and foster our companies by, by fulfilling some of their needs. Uh, so to me, it's not really a, a protectionist perspective. It's more about uh, they have, they are customers as well and treating them as customers and they want to launch when they want to launch or they need a satellite to do a particular mission. Just last week, there was a release from our government about some uh, issues within D&D and the things that they want to do and monitoring, you know, earth imaging and monitoring. So I think the opportunity is there for them to, to play a role. Um, but it is true that most of the international treaties are all country to country specific, whether it's a, a missile technology control regime, how we're going to operate in space together. And they need to really work to try to collaborate with all these commercial industries now that are taking off uh, to make sure that we're all complementing each other and not really fighting each other. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, one thing I, I, I'll just toss up uh, about, you know, what can government do? Because isn't, the, isn't there a concern about space debris and the, it interfering with the, you know, commercial development and, and broadly, you know, uh, you know, functionality in, in near Earth uh, space? Uh, and it, but, but so I'll toss that one out there. But also, David, you, you are the, uh, you, you have the sole U.S. perspective on this with Alex uh, unavailable today. So I was hoping you could add some thoughts about how you see the role of, of you know, the, the U.S. government in particular uh, and what it can do to help and, uh, you know, uh, support uh, the, the industry while also protecting the public interest. Yeah, no, absolutely. The the I mean, look, the, the U.S. government, it was a very painful shift and took a long time. Uh, actually, Lori Garver, the former deputy administrator of NASA, who was one of the key people who helped push uh, NASA toward commercial space and toward the, the, the COTS agreements and the CLIPS agreements with, with SpaceX to provide services, both providing uh, transport services for cargo, but then ultimately humans into space. Um, and uh, Lori gave a very interesting interview and has written a book recently about this whole, you know, the push to do it and how difficult it was. Um, but I think now, uh, you know, even in my time at SpaceX, I'd say the military was still a little skeptical, certainly was skeptical of doing, of using reusable rockets, for example, and, and now has completely shifted that over the course of just a few years. So I think the tipping point has been reached and, and, you know, all of these different companies that are successfully uh, building rockets, reaching orbit, uh, show that the government investment in the commercial space sector has been very, very effective. And that obviously, you know, uh, affects the entire globe, right? It's not just the U.S. It's going to affect all countries, how they view uh, getting into space. And you'll see most space agencies shifting toward commercial operations uh, or you leveraging commercial operations in order to achieve the, the missions that they need to achieve. So I think that tipping point has been reached. Uh, and what you're going to see going forward is, is commercial space taking the lead on almost all of the things that you otherwise would have thought government was going to do. And even things like as, as ambitious as getting back to the moon um, and getting to Mars. Look, SpaceX's entire company mission is to establish a self-sustaining colony on Mars before Elon dies. Elon said to me during his interview, I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. And when he means a self-sustaining colony on Mars, I mean, he means hundreds of thousands of people who have enough infrastructure that they don't even need to use uh, rockets from Earth to survive. And that is his mission to, to get that done by the time he's age 70. And he's 50 now. 
and so I think what you're going to see is a rapid acceleration of private companies taking the lead on these kinds of initiatives. And I think that that's going to, that's going to be true across the globe, Canada uh, and throughout the world, you're going to see this, this kind of activity and just a flourishing of space companies. Right. Well, it, it, you know, uh, it just uh, I noticed uh, some article recently that said uh, they're identifying super Earths that may be more inhabitable, uh, uh, whatever, even than the planet we're on here. Um, and, uh, you know, so maybe Elon will just make Mars a, uh, a stepping oh, stone. No, what's amazing is so Elon's goal is to make <laughs> a self-sustaining colony on Mars. Gwyn Shockwell, who's the president and COO, wants to make life interplanet interstellar. Right. Her goal there you go. is there to, you make, go. You know, to be start colonizing, you know, other stars. Yeah. So there's no, there's no lack of ambition of what the for what the plans are. And what most people what's amazing is people hear this as science fa uh, fantasy. And the reality yeah. of it is the Mars colony ships have already been built. They're being built at a rapid pace down in Texas. And that Starship rocket, which is designed to carry 100 colonists on the six month journey to Mars, is built and has already flown and landed successfully. So it, the, the, the revolution is, is coming. It's Elon's coming. Plan, is, plan is to land a human on Mars by 2027. That's like within this decade. That's the blink of an eye. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's amazing. It's happening. Uh, that, and, and so exciting. Uh, let, uh, let me just uh, see, we've got, uh, I think one other question that's been posted, and that is, how do the panelists view the new nuclear propulsion variable to the overall space equation? Anybody have a thought about that? Nuclear propulsion. The nuclear propulsion they're speaking of is for the satellites once they're in orbit. And there's certainly going to be a significant change in ISP, the gas mileage, if you will, uh, for those satellites to be able to exist. It's just whether uh, we can do it safely or not is really the key. I think um, I think for me, I'm no expert in nuclear propulsion, but um, I, I uh, you hear about the, the change in um, transit rates that, uh, that, that it's expected to be able to offer, whether that's uh, from um, Earth to Moon or uh, Moon to Mars or beyond. And so for me, um, anything, anytime you have a, an order of magnitude change in key uh, factors, um, much as uh, David mentioned that the launch costs uh, is really a key enabler where it changes space. Um, it changes uh, uh, missions, it changes what, what uh, the accessibility limit of space, and uh, you all of a sudden have all of these new missions where um, uh, what wouldn't make sense before economically now makes sense. And so um, if we can, uh, through nuclear or whatever, uh, obtain some of those increased uh, transit rates uh, from an exploration standpoint, um, I think that's a game changer in, in terms of um, you look at traditional propulsion and the amount of uh, fuel required to, to transit uh, takes up such a large percentage of, uh, of the mass as you go. Um, but uh, I won't speak any more on nuclear. I'm not an expert. I think the key big change, the, the real big change is, is, the, is the cost to lower Earth orbit, right? That's the, that's the key, uh, the first step. And that's why Elon has been so focused on it. And that's why Maritime Launch Services is so focused on this, is getting, getting access to low Earth orbit is key. Just to give you a reference, so when I first started at SpaceX, even the, 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 not too long ago, the, a dedicated launch was about a you know, minimum of $250 million, and that was considered incredibly cheap. And while I was there, it dropped $150 million and $50 million. And then you know, Elon asked us to put together a program where you could order 250 kilograms to low Earth orbit for a million dollars and you can order it in 30 seconds from your smartphone. And we did it and actually booked our first customers using a smartphone and the lawyers on the other side from a big government contractor called like a week later said, are you serious about these terms on a mobile phone for launch? And well, yeah, absolutely, we're serious. That's how you get a million dollars, but a million dollar price tag. But what's amazing is with Starship, this new rocket, which will likely be orbital this year is my guess, that will allow you to lift instead of 250 kilograms, you'll be able to lift 250 metric tons ultimately to low earth orbit for a million dollars, the same price, two more orders of magnitude reduction in price. And at that scale, the capacity, the size, this, the, the, literally the scale of what you could launch, it completely changes everything. And so no longer are you building $500 million, billion dollar 
you know, massive satellite that take five or 10 years to, to launch. Now you can launch basically disposable satellites. And that's why you're seeing this proliferation of so many different satellites up in space and these huge constellations being built because the cost of launch is just so much cheaper. And now you can launch these cheap uh, off the shelf uh, programs that, that can make an incredible difference back on earth. It's just jaw dropping uh, how rapid Rapidly, the price has come down and, and where things are going to be in just a few short years. Uh, but let me ask uh, each of the panelists, uh, you know, what is the greatest challenge you and your company face right now? I can go first because <laughs> I deal with Thank it every you, day. Holly. Thank um, you, Holly. Um, uh, for, for us, it's hiring. Um, with the uh, with the increased volume, uh, as we've all just talked about in the space industry um, and, and the increased opportunities, um, we uh, we're seeing uh, commercial opportunities for uh, commercial variants of Canadarm uh, robotics uh, in parallel and sometimes outpacing uh, our latest Canadarm three development. And so we would have recently announced um, uh, a contract with Axiom Space to deliver uh, commercial uh, robotic interfaces for Canadarm three which is just interesting when you think about the pace. And so um, we, uh, we are on a, a, a significant growth trajectory um, and we're hiring so many people um, that uh, it's, uh, it's really been our, our primary focus this year is to bring in uh, uh, the right talent, um, get them um, uh, uh, working efficiently on, on programs and on product development. Um, and uh, meeting our meeting our milestones and our commitments, and so uh, we continue to do that uh, every day. Uh, so far, uh, across uh, all of MDA, we've hired more than 500 people uh, this year, um, and we're, we we keep going. So for us, uh, the the human element and, and hiring is the is the key key one for us right now. For 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 rocket launch, it's kind of an interesting twist. We've got a regulatory environment in the United States that's basically run and ruled by the FAA, or if you're on a, a federal range by the DOD or whoever owns that range. And that adds a lot of complexity and challenges that are different than a commercial launch company. Just the, the pace that we work as a commercial launch company and the ability to get stuff done happens a lot quicker in our world. And the, the you know, older bureaucracies that have been in place for many, many decades, going back to the 50s, frankly, is, is really been a challenge for us to really break through. We have an opportunity in Canada, though, that we're, we're sort of breaking new ground with Canadian launch capability, and the federal government is engaging to make things really happen with us on that regulatory front. So to me, the biggest challenge is really trying to get us as a globe really to work together to uh, foster the development of the commercial launch. There, there is only two commercial launch sites on Earth right now, true commercial launch sites. New Zealand uh, with, with uh, Pete Back and what Rocket Lab has going with 150 kilogram launch and maritime launch services. I, I don't count what SpaceX is doing in Brownsville because they're not selling it. They're just going to Mars. They've got their plan from that site and they're not selling seats necessarily for, for a profit. But from a commercial launch perspective where we're launching satellites into space for private customers, um, everybody else on the planet is using government ranges, whether it's Karoo, uh, India, um, you know, East Coast, West Coast, even uh, state-owned places in Alaska, what have you. And so getting government out of the way a little bit uh, would, would help us move, move forward as a, and I think I'm speaking in terms of the entire commercial launch industry. How can we be truly a commercial launch industry uh, commercial space industry, rather, uh, only using government ranges. It's really got to break that mold. And that's where a lot of uh, other places internationally have come to Maritime Launch and have asked us to replicate what we're doing in other locations. They want to get uh, government kind of out of the way and commercial really operating these places. How much you can actually do Maritime Maritime Launch? I mean, one of the things SpaceX is doing, of course, is ultimately planning to put these things on huge semi-submersible oil rigs that are converted into launch and landing platforms. I mean, for, for lots of reasons, but what do you think about that? The, the, the mobile platform, the, the sea platforms, well, sea launch has been done before. Unfortunately, it wasn't uh, a very lucrative, uh, of course, a joint venture between Boeing and, and Russia and, and going out to sea from Long Beach uh, to the equator to launch. 
had its effect on launch for sure, but the cost of having the the the, the control you know, command and control ship and the launch ship uh, platforms were were too expensive really to to do what they needed to do. Small launchers maybe larger. SpaceX launchers. does it cheap. <laughs> SpaceX just converts barges into landing platforms. Landing is a little different than launching, but it's certainly possible. And, and, and again, it's to your point earlier, there's a whole paradigm shift in how expensive it is to, to get stuff into space and how we're going to do things. We, we're still historically using liquid oxygen and kerosene, though, in our first stages, mm. and that goes back uh, forever. So the idea that if we're really going to break a mold on the price per kilogram. Yes, we're fitting around the edges. We're doing it faster, better, cheaper, et cetera. And the prices are plummeting, but there's not going to be a quantum shift until there really is some, some quantum change in propulsion. SpaceX is using liquid methane. It's using waste gas from Texas. I mean, literally gas that is just fuel, flared off across Texas and lots of other oil producing areas as a waste. That's the fuel that's, that fuels Starship. So but that's why the price can be so cheap. But it's still a bipropellant that has minimal ISP benefits compared to other vehicles, right? So we're still in that same ballpark of miles per gallon, if you will. It's until we make a shift. And I don't think nuclear is actually the answer um, myself. And, and I'm going full Star Trek on you here. I think there's a, whole <laughs> different, there's a full, whole different angle of propulsion that I think we need to reach to uh, to really make the game changes. You've got a secret anti-gravity patent, don't you? <laughs> Let me, you know, so we go back, uh, you know, uh, from from Sputnik to now. Uh, roughly, do we have something like five thousand satellites launched? Um, it, when we go, just by the end of this decade, how many satellites will be in Earth orbit? Oh my gosh! So look, of those five thousand, SpaceX alone has launched twenty six hundred. And that 5,000 is prior to including the Starlink, you know, the satellite. So, but that gives you a sense of the change in the last few years of the number of satellites going into orbit. You know, the constellations, OneWeb's planning a three, 4,000 satellite constellation. Uh, Amazon, through its Kuiper division, is doing another few thousand constellations. China has not one, not two, but three different low Earth orbit commu uh, communications constellations going up. You know, I, I think that you'll see you know, right now, a Falcon 9 can launch between 50 and 60 Starlink satellites at a go each time. And it's, you know, they're doing it on almost a weekly pace. Um, and Starship can launch hundreds, hundreds of, satellite, of satellites at once. And so what I think you'll see is, is even if no one else does it, you're going to see you know, tens of thousands of, of satellites in space by the end of this decade. Tens of thousands. The FCC filing deadline from last October is a good good gauge, right? There were 37,000 additional satellites requested in that filing with seven or eight different companies total, right? Telesat, OneWeb, et cetera. Uh, and, and it does go Telesat, back. I shouldn't ignore Telesat. Yeah, Telesat, another big player in the space. You know, how, how, can we, how can we accommodate that kind of uh, number of satellites in space is a whole nother direction of conversation, I think. I don't, you know what? I think that's completely overblown. I still think that's overblown. I'm looking out of the Pacific Ocean right now. If I told you there were 20,000 boats tooling around the Pacific Ocean at any given time, or there were 20,000 cars driving on the freeway in a, in a little town somewhere, it's nothing. Right. I mean, this. How many this aircraft focus. in the? How many aircraft uh, in the sky? Ten know, uh, tens of thousands. And but, we do uh, uh, air traffic yeah. control, and space is a hell of a lot bigger than than the air than the, the ocean, and space is a hell of a lot bigger than the air airspace. And space, it turns out, has lots of levels too. Right. You got orbits well, at five hundred, three D, five fifty, and it's three D. Right, like Star Trek. Right, like Wrath of Khan. You got to you got to think in three dimensions. It's huge. But I think from a defense standpoint, there I, I know there are some concerns about space debris and and uh, from a, a safety standpoint, and also just from a uh, you know from I, I have a feeling that's a, a commercial opportunity for some folks. See, this uh, is where I wanted to get into arguing with Alex, stealing from privateer, which what they're doing is I think it's I think it's quite a bit overblown. Yeah, for sure. If you get hit by a, something moving at twenty five thousand miles an hour, even if it's pretty small. If you get hit, that's bad. I'm not saying it's good, especially if there's humans inside the craft. It's bad. But right now, the 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 the, the tolerance they have, especially for human space life, so like is is within between like five and ten kilometer approach for these objects. 
Now, granted, they're very dangerous and they're moving very, very fast. But the reality is you don't need that much margin and certainly not for commercial satellites. You know, if you've got a margin of 100 meters, you're, you're, you're more than safe. And so I think it's a question, what you're seeing is a lot of space awareness companies that start up, and I've been pitched on literally a dozen of them, where they're called space situational awareness companies, where they are very closely tracking all the debris in orbit. But I think it's like the, it's, it's like the air, tra air traffic control system. You know, planes don't run into each other in the sky very often. And that's because you have sophisticated computers and, you know, government requirements for location, very precise location of the aircraft. And as long as you do that and make sure that the, everyone's monitoring and it moves in advance, you don't see any collisions. It's very rare. The, 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 challenge, space. the challenge to that, David, is that we don't know where everything is. We're players all sorts of up there doing all sorts of things that we're not fully aware of. You have an ASAT that, that takes out a satellite and turns it into a debris field of, of, of tens of thousands of particles that are moving at that velocity. I had a colleague at DND that put it this way. I'm, 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 you know, FAA air traffic control, and I'm watching aircraft coming into an airport. And oh yeah, I can tell you where 80% of the aircraft are. I think it's okay for you to land, but you don't know where all of them are. That that's the really kind of the risk factor. I think is that there isn't adequate tracking, and there aren't necessarily all the best players out there doing things in space. And it doesn't take much to really start a cascade. I think if if um, there are some bad events that occur. So. so, I mean, I suspect that there's a lot of free flowing information in the, in the US and Canada about what is being sent up into space and where it is. Uh, but that leads into a question about what else is going on in the world. And we know that uh, many nations are rushing headlong uh, into space. Uh, I, I just wonder if you might comment about, you know, North America has had such a wonderful leadership role, but uh, what about the competition outside North America? Anybody want to, that for your company or just in general? I can sure speak to that um, from, from a launch perspective, you know, there, there's not a significant market share. We need to be utterly and completely successful and reach a full launch tempo for the capabilities of our site, given the huge uh, capability or needs out there in industry. I mean, just having Soyuz go offline with a medium class launcher that was launching over 20 times a year certainly opens it up even more for us. So we're, we don't need a great deal to be successful at what we're doing. We just want to do it safely and environmentally uh, con with an environmental awareness and consciousness. What is what is uh, going on? How, how are you handling with the, the situation in Ukraine with your, your supply? Um, business. Every everyone is safe and in place and working and missing their families, but working every day in, in Dnipro. Uh, they're currently working on uh, two more vehicles for Antares right now, uh, one for September launch. And so we're working on the, uh, the first stage uh, for our launch vehicle. Our upper stage is 100% complete, fully tested, integrated, and ready for production. So it's just an, an integration piece for that first stage that's ongoing. Uh, right now, I wouldn't ship it out uh, the, the, the normal way. Uh, I'd probably have to uh, take it out uh, on, a, on a tractor trailer through Poland. But uh, nonetheless, the process is still working. Do you worry about like things like, you know, speaking of investment, I mean, that's part of the panel we're talking about. Like, do you worry about what happened to companies like Firefly Aerospace with uh, the U.S. government banning investment from Ukraine into the company and operations? And they, they literally stopped operations of the company because of there was a, a Ukrainian investor on the board. I don't think we fully know the backstory of all the aspects of, of, of why, you know, they wanted Max out of that. And, and uh, we don't have an investor uh, in Ukraine that's investing in our launch vehicle. We have, a, we have what is arguably the most mature launching com uh, country in the entire planet going back 70 years. Uh, producing, you know, 800 and some odd uh, successful launches and over 400 satellites into space that uh, eclipses anything anybody else is doing. So from a safety and risk perspective, we're certainly going with the right one at this point. And uh, well, I don't see those kinds of issues. 
Now, we could talk a whole bunch about the investment framework, Jay, about where we're going and how SPACs are happening and people are doing crazy things with uh, going public and whether all the, there's room for all these companies to succeed. I think that's a, a very reasonable place to go, but I'm not sure the, you know, what, what, uh, uh, the, the, who the uh, base investors are really matters too much. Jane. We're getting toward the end of our, our program and, uh, you know, uh, I hope we might reconvene this panel, but uh, uh, to, to continue, because there's so much we could cover uh, in the short term. But let me take you just a little bit longer term and, and ask each of you to comment. Uh, if we were to have a CABC program on commercial opportunities in space in 2030, what would the panelists likely, what would be, you think, top of mind for them? Well, from a uh, capital market standpoint, I think you can see obviously proliferation of companies and spin-off companies in the industry. They, David talked a bit about that earlier. I mean, just as a perfect example, um, you know, lunar and beyond investment currently is 10% of the 14 billion, actually barely 10%. But the significance of it is that that's virtually doubled over the last couple of years. So you're seeing where that, that trend is going, um, where the investor you know, confidence is going. Um, you know, we're at the earlier stages of, of, of the industry from an investment standpoint for, in, a, in a you know totally commercial industry, having gone from a highly regulated, centralized government planning uh, type of industry to, to a commercial, uh, to commercial sector. So, I think in 2030, you're gonna see um, very large numbers uh, in terms of investment and, and ongoing current revenue uh, and a significant expansion of, um, of the subsectors that investors are looking at. Mars real Holly, estate opportunities. Mars real estate opportunities, that's what I predict. <laughs> the metaverse, yeah, Mars. I, the real verse. Yeah. Metaverse, the real, not metaverse. The real Mars. Oh, I, want yeah. to, I want to extrapolate your uh, your mobile phone reservation uh, uh, comment, David, and and go so far to say is uh, there'll be Airbnb bookings on uh, on and from Mars real estate perspective. But uh, we could only be so hopeful in in twenty thirty. Um, I, I agree with Sash. I think that um, uh, Lunar uh, represents a huge opportunity. Um, certainly, uh, partners and folks that we talk to now, there's a, there's a huge interest in uh, uh, setting up camp, obviously on surface of the moon and uh, around the moon to enable that uh, eventual. Um, uh, missions uh, to Mars. Um, I think that uh, uh, along with commercial investment, I think commercial partnerships have a key um, uh, a role to play in that. And certainly we're seeing um, uh, companies uh, and, and private investment get out ahead of some of those uh, uh, government uh, it, um, aspirations and uh, offer things like services on the moon. And so um, I, I hope we're talking about that in 2030. Stephen? Yeah, I, I see. I see this industry right sizing on the launch perspective, but just expanding hugely in in the science and, and opportunities in space and the things we can do to solve some of our uh, larger problems here on Earth, as well as the far reaching things in space. I think that uh, there, there, there's as much as things have miniaturized and technology has changed our environment and how we're working today and what the satellites are doing with you know, methane leaks or monitoring and, and those kinds of things. I think we're just really scratching the surface and we're gonna be pretty amazed at some of the things that we can do, not just looking out from earth into deep space, but looking into earth and what we can do to make a real difference here. Exciting. Uh, and David, I'm going to let, I'm going to give you the, uh, the last word, as they say here. Yeah, I think that the, I, I think Stephen, exactly right. I think a lot of these things, I, I talk a lot about, you know, Mars, and we're talking a lot about the moon and, and human exploration space and crazy things are going to do, but a lot of these impacts are going to be felt on Earth. I mean, you just look at these low Earth orbit internet uh, broadband systems, you know, you see what happened in the Ukraine with Starlink, you know, being made available and 15,000 units being dropped in the country and the system being turned on instantaneously to give broadband internet access anywhere on the planet at any time. And what people don't realize, I think, is that these systems are going to completely transform the whole telecommunications industry. You know, one of the big areas we're looking at and what we've invested in already is, is space lasers, right? Space optical communications links, so they call them, or at SpaceX, they call them sweet ass space lasers. And what they do is they, they're basically a fiber optic cable in space that allows you to transmit 
multiple, multiple gigabits per second with relatively inexpensive receivers on each end and no need for a fiber optic cable. And then on top of that, people are working on laser downlinks, which means instead of using radio frequency, they use uh, laser beams to communicate to the ground, which suddenly you don't have any spectrum issues and you also have incredibly fast speeds uh, with very low latency, certainly from low earth orbit. And what that means is that the entire telecommunications industry will get disrupted. I mean, at a certain point in not too many years, you're going to receive your phone signal and your internet from on your phone. Just like GPS now, you can get right on your phone. It used to be you had to have a big receiver to get GPS. Now you can get it on your phone. And the same thing will happen with broadband internet and telephony. And that, those kinds of examples, a very simple example, that's going to disrupt a trillion dollar industry. So I think you're going to see a lot of incredible changes with just that one example. There's lots of examples like that. You're going to see incredible changes in how things on Earth are, are serviced from space. Well, this has been, uh, you know, a wonderful and mind expanding uh, session and my uh, sincere thanks to each member of the panel and to each one of the participants in this event. Uh, my sincere apologies to the very civilized North Americans in the chat whose questions we did not uh, get to answer today, but I hope we'll be able to organize another program in the not too distant future. But for now, um, uh, uh, unless uh, Chelsea wants to uh, correct me or another, or, or Lena, uh, my co-chair of the, the entrepreneur circle, uh, it, it says I've made some omission. I do want to just conclude here right on time here at three o'clock and just say, uh, you know, a sincere thanks to each, to one and all. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, everyone.